Hello, my name is Cody Price and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 o'clock, so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today on February 18th, we'll have a presentation on coastal development and regulatory realities given by John Casey. Uh, for help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer um, those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of our participating chapters, divisions, and universities and I would like to um, Send out a personal thank you to the Connecticut chapter for sponsoring today's event. Here's a list of our upcoming webcast. On next Wednesday, we'll have a, um, a continuation of our series on the aging population. So if you want to check those out, um, there's one on the developing aging friendly communities. Um, and then we'll have a, another one on February 25th on a framework for assessing aging in the place technologies. Um, I just want to point out as well is just that we recently added the March 11th Urban Retail Webinar, so if you're interested in that, um, please be sure to sign up. And you'll be able to find a complete listing um, for our 2011 webcast schedule um, at the following address at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast.htm. And so um, you will be able to find a complete listing, and if you find ones that interest you, feel free to um, register for those events. Um, to log CM credit for attending today's session, you'll need to go to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by date, and then select today's date, Friday, February 18th, and then select coastal development and regulatory realities. Um, and again, this is already up for one and a half CM credits, so you can go and uh, attain those after the session today. And then afterwards, we are recording today's session, so you'll be able to find a um, video recording and a PDF of today's um, presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast.htm. And then this should be up by Monday. And at this time, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. So, uh, John Casey is an attorney with Robinson & Cool LLP a law firm with over 225 attorneys and nine offices throughout the Northeast and Florida. John has been with the firm since 2002 and practices out of its New London, Hartford, and Providence offices. John's practice covers all aspects of land use law with a particular emphasis on coastal management, development, and permitting littoral and riparian water rights and litigation related to land use, permitting, and property rights. John began his legal career as a lieutenant Lieutenant in the U.S. Navy, Judge Advocate General's Corps, fulfilling various legal duties while stationed at the Naval Submarine Base in Groton. After completing his military service, but before joining Robinson and Cold, he worked for a small firm in New London. John is a member of the Board of Directors, Executive Committee, and Audit Committee for Connecticut Legal Services, a private nonprofit civil law firm dedicated to providing access to justice as a means of improving the lives of low-income people throughout Connecticut. John is also a volunteer with Lawyers for Children America, providing representation to child victims in abuse and neglect proceedings. The president of the Board of Directors of the Connecticut Cruise Ship Task Force, a nonprofit entity that promotes and coordinates cruise ship visits to ports within the state. He's also a member of the Board of the Mystic and Nunnick Library and a member of the board of the New London Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that provides grants for educational programs in New London. John also coaches youth lacrosse for the Rotan Mystic Lacrosse Association. John earned his uh, JD summa cum laude from American University's Washington College of Law in Washington, D.C., and his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Connecticut. And now I'd like to hand it over to John Casey, who will be giving a presentation for today. Uh, thank you, Cody, uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, I, uh, I wonder how I have any time to, to practice law when I hear that list of all the other things I do. But um, as Cody said, my, um, 
uh, my primary practice area here in Connecticut is is coastal development, and I'm happy to um, to to be with you all today, with you in in spirit over the internet, um, to talk about um, the, the sort of permitting regime and the the statutes that that control um, coastal permitting. Also, to talk about some of the the legal issues that arise in coastal um, development issues or coastal management issues, uh, and also talk about some uh, uh, recent developments and some examples of things that come up, uh, which I find uh, to be a good way to, to understand the issues. Okay. I guess we'll just start and I, for a bunch of planners, you all know why it's important to regulate uses and, and um, but I wanted to address, you know, why specifically on the coast is it important. Um, and the first issue is we, we want to protect the environment. Uh, the, the bullet here shows that in Connecticut um, it's estimated that 90 percent of tidal wetlands uh, have been lost uh, due to filling, dredging, and similar activities. Now, most of these losses have taken place decades and, and decades ago. Um, in fact, Connecticut is, is very good. Um, in a recent report I read from the uh, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, Connecticut has only seen a loss of one acre of Thailand, uh, tidal wetlands in the past few years, per year. So that's an excellent um, a track record of protecting these uh, important resources, which serve, as you probably know, as big sponges to um, to uh, filter out pollutants, as well as to, pr to provide uh, flood protection from the incoming um, waves. And the other side of it, from a, a zoning point of view, is to protect life and property. As we're close to the coastline, the uh, FEMA rules come into effect about floodplain management and flood zone management. And um, a recent estimate is that those policies and regulations have prevented over $1.1 billion um, dollars annually in flood damage. So now who regulates, um, who do you have to deal with? And it's, it's the entire spectrum from the federal agencies, state agencies, and local agencies. And as an example of, of a project that I've recently been involved with, um, for a residential dock in the Fairfield County section of Connecticut, the, the applicant applied uh, to the state, which then forwards the application to the Army Corps, who then forwards it to um, the federal resource agencies, EPA, NOAA, and NIMPS, NF, is, that's National Marine Fisheries Services. Um, the Fisheries Service and EPA had a concern about the design of the, the structure. Um, it was proposed to have a fixed pier with a gangway to a, a floating dock. They were concerned about the impacts of a floating dock on the, the benthic environment, the, um, the mud. Um, that's under the water. And so th there was a, a process of dealing with federal agencies, because the Army Corps, who's the permitting uh, agency, wouldn't sign off until the resource agencies were satisfied. And then we had to go to back to the state agency, the environmental, uh, in Connecticut's Department of Environmental Protection. Um, who generally was okay with the the proposal, but didn't didn't want to issue a permit if there wasn't going to be a federal permit. Um, the process here in Connecticut allowed for a public hearing because we were in tidal wetlands, which um, some neighbors petitioned for. So we had a complete um, administrative hearing. Um, we then, after we got through that process and were issued the state permit. We just, on Tuesday, had to go to the local zoning um, commission, which has jurisdiction over those portions of the dock that are above the um, mean high wall. 
between waters and uh, town property. So it can be a very complex um, uh, permitting uh, process. And you may also have to, depending on your state or your town, uh, deal with the Harbor Management Commission, a Shellfish Commission. Uh, Connecticut, I just skipped right over. If there's any shellfish resources, you have to deal with um, the Bureau of Aquaculture. And the pressure, um, it is so highly regulated because there's a lot of pressure on the coast. Um, and I'll try to get through these pretty quickly. 53% of the population in, in the state, in the nation, live in 17% of all the land area, which is 673 coastal counties, which is an increase of 33 million people since 1980. And to show you how the development here is in Connecticut, red, on this slide, red represents more intense development. And you can just see along the major, um, along the shore, and the major waterway, um, uh, which is the Connecticut River, which runs from the center of the state um, down and then slightly to the um, southeast, uh, the Connecticut River, and then in the southeast corner, uh, the little red patches, uh, the New London Groton area. I'll have to correct Cody on his pronunciation of my hometown. Uh, it's Groton, Connecticut. So you can see where people are. Are, are living. And in another example, because I do think pictures um, are worth a thousand words, this is an aerial photo from 1934 of the um, Westport of Westport, Connecticut, the uh, Saugatuck River. And you can see, if you just look at the, the edges of the shoreline, it's, 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 it's natural for the most part. You see a few features. There's a canal in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, you can see the roads. You can see the land, the upland divided. Um, but the coastline meanders. Um, there's tidal wetlands. There's little tidal creeks. You fast forward. I'm sorry. There we go. To the same area today. And you can see how the coastline is just completely changed. It's it's a uniform um, line. Um, it's, there's been fill in the wetlands. There's been a lot of houses placed there. Um, and this, you know, is the big change. And protecting what remaining resources that we have is the the reason we have such uh, uh, such tight regulations. But we are dealing with, as you in any situation, private ownership. Um, in Connecticut, I'll talk about um, private ownership uh, starts and ends at the mean high water line, which is marked there in red. Uh, a couple other lines of interest um, that you have to deal with. Um, unlike when you're just dealing with an upland property where you have a boundary, uh, which is pretty well established and, and understood as to where it is where the right-of-way line is on a street. Uh, at the shore, um, you have a number of lines and resources that you have to deal with, and each of them um, impact how things are regulated. But we'll start with private ownerships, um, the mean high water line. When you're at the shore, you have to deal with the public trust doctrine, which um, um, covers, it starts in Connecticut at that mean high water line, and it's this area in red on, on the slide. Um, once you get below mean high water, that's where the state has an interest in protecting the resources and the interest of the, of the public to use the water uh, and use the resources. Um, and just, I have a note there, that state title to submerged lands goes out three miles under the Submerged Land Act. So the state regulates um, that area, which if you're in New England and you're following any of these proposals for offshore wind farms, um, that will determine whether the, uh, the turbines will be in state waters or federal waters. And just 
be about public trust because it does sort of overlay um, how the state has to approach these. It's a very ancient doctrine. It goes back to uh, Roman times where the concept was that um, the sovereign would hold in trust and control for the benefit of the, the, um, of the empire, really, the resources that were necessary to the public commerce, which would be access to tidelands, access to water for navigation, um, uh, and rights to the shoreline and waters for fishing. These rights were incorporated into English common law and then brought over uh, to the colonies um, and are made part of uh, American common law. These rights were um, recognized. One of the more famous cases is the Illinois Central case. Uh, this is where uh, the uh, state of Connecticut tried to convey title to lands underneath um, Lake Michigan. And the, the um, Supreme Court said they couldn't do that um, because they were abdicating or uh, their rights to um, their public trust rights. So this is a very significant um, uh, concept, I guess, and an obligation of the state when it comes to regulating along the shoreline. Of course, the public trust applies to other things, but we'll focus on, it, on how it applies to the shoreline. In Connecticut, just quickly, uh, just so you know that this does apply, you know, at the state level, here's what the, the Supreme Court in Connecticut said just as recently as 1994, um, that the state, as a representative of the public, is the owner of all lands between the high and low water marks upon navigable waters. And because the state owns that land when it comes to permits along the shore, um, that's a property interest and an obligation that has to be considered. Overlaid on that are the private property rights of the uh, upland um, property owners. They're known as littoral rights, uh, sometimes referred to as riparian rights. Um, and in every case in Connecticut, the court always puts a footnote saying they're used interchangeably, but uh, the, the, the actual term is littoral uh, for navigable and tidal waters. Um, it, under Connecticut law, the waterfront property owner has certain exclusive rights to use the water um, uh, that, that fronts his property. And, and where his littoral boundaries are based on the, the shape of the shoreline and the intersection of the property boundaries with the mean high water line. Going back to what I said earlier, that line being the extent of private property ownership. The thing about littoral rights and littoral boundary lines is they don't really exist. It's not like the survey um, that we're all used to. Um, even if you're, you you got property that goes back 100 years with boundary markers you know, by the old oak tree and along the rock wall, um, uh, in 99% in of the matters that I've been involved with, you really don't have littoral boundaries set out. Neighboring property owners can establish them by agreement, or they can go to court and, and ask a, a court to establish them based on uh, some uh, principles. And then once you have, the, you have those rights, my last bullet there, is that they are subject to regulation, but the question is, how much? And a few quick examples. This is always a fun exercise. I've been involved in a few littoral boundary cases, and how you establish um, where your rights are uh, it depends on, as I said, the shape of the shoreline and the intersection of the private property with the, um, with the high water mark. Uh, so you have to decide if you're dealing with a straight shoreline um, where you draw you, this line, the, the sort of dotted dashed line, which is in the water, take my word for it. Um, you draw that line along the shore and then you draw, at 90 degree angles, you draw back to the intersection of the side yard boundaries, and, and that's your property, that's your littoral boundary area. And your, bound, your littoral boundary area, uh, or your littoral area, is no bigger than the, uh, the length of the shoreline. But you, 
different funny uh, opinions about where the, the boundaries are because it depends. Because if someone could call this uh, a straight shoreline, they can call it a curved convex shoreline. Um, here's another curved convex shoreline. You can call it a concave curved shoreline. It just depends on the, the shoreline features. So I'll move on. So how do we get how do we get regulation at the the um, along the coast um, while states had coastal um, permitting statutes uh, before 1972, um, it was really the the passage of the Coastal Zone Managing Act by Congress in 1972 that that focused on coastal zone management. And what it is, it's a voluntary partnership between the federal government and the U.S. coastal states and territories. Um, 34 of the 35 states and five island territories have developed coastal zone management programs. Illinois is the last one working on obtaining approval for its program. They, uh, it's been very successful. It protects more than 99% of the nation's 95,331 miles of ocean and, and uh, Great Lakes shoreline. And the purpose is to, to focus on balancing, um, which, which really are, I, I write it here, but competing land and water uses while protecting sensitive coastal resources. What the, what the federal government is looking for um, in coastal zone management programs um, are those that would uh, result in enforceable policies to protect um, the coastal resources. And then there's this process um, called federal consistency. Um, any federal action has to um, be consistent with a state's federally approved coastal management program. And those are any federal actions that have um, a reasonably foreseeable effect on land or water use or natural resource in the coastal zone. And what are those federal actions? Uh, they're broken down into four areas, federal agency activities. Those are just like it sounds, anything done by a federal agency, uh, which include fishery plans by National Marine Fishery Service, naval exercises, uh, disposal of federal land, uh, an Army Corps project like a breakwater or beach renourishment, or um, oil and gas lease uh, leases um, by, I guess, what used to be the MMS. Uh, federal license or permit activities. This is where you run into this for the most part. If the Army Corps is going to grant a permit to an individual or an entity, for a non-federal entity, um, then that permit decision has to be consistent with the um, state's coastal uh, management program. And this is where this, where you run into this uh, mostly in the permitting world. Um, the last two outer continental shelf plans and federal assistance to state and local governments. I'll, since we're talking about permitting here, I'll going to focus on the, the second one. So this comes up mainly when you're trying to get an Army Corps permit and the, the Corps' regulatory jurisdiction is under two uh, primary um, statutes, Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbor Act and Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. And here's a little um, going with the same um, diagram so you see what we're talking about. And Section 10 jurisdiction is the mean high water line. OK. Um, The, the process um, by which Army Corps permits are, are issued is 
primarily through, at least in New England, um, the programmatic general permits, which are issued state by state. And they cover both coastal, inland wetland activities, um, structures, dredging, filling, and disposal of dredge material. And just so you get a sense, um, Section 10, I'll go back, um, of the Rivers and Harbor Acts deals with structures uh, and encroachments into navigable waters and fill um, dredging of, um, of, uh, of any navigable waterway. And Section 404 deals with the, in the coastal realm, um, a lot, most of the times, disposal of dredged materials. Drilling down then uh, to Connecticut as our example, Connecticut um, has uh, two permitting statutes that it, it administers at the state level. Uh, the first is called the Structures, Dredging, and Fill Act, and um, where the jurisdiction is the High Tide Line, and the Title Wetlands Act, and um, which are Title Wetlands Areas. The, the, juris, the definition is there, um, but in general, it, it's any tidal wetlands area or area that is capable of growing uh, tidal wetlands plants. And in Connecticut, the um, permitting under these statutes is by the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. These um, programs, these statutes, um, are what's known as the enforceable policies um, under the state's um, Coastal Zone Management Act. And when you're talking, going back to the concept I mentioned earlier, federal consistency, um, federal permits have to be consistent with um, the, the um, permitting under these acts by the state um, in order to obtain a federal permit. And it, the administration of these two acts are specifically part of Connecticut's um, Coastal Zone Management Program. The final piece of Connecticut's um, coastal management uh, policies is what's known as the Coastal Management Act, which um, is quite lengthy. Um, but it regulates all the development with, within an area defined as the coastal boundary, which is um, anywhere within the 100-year flood boundary or a 1,000-foot setback um, measured from mean high water or the inland boundary of really any uh, coastal resource. And so whichever, whichever those two numbers is the furthest inland. But unlike permits for structures um, such as a dock or dredging or any activities in tidal wetlands which are exclusively under the jurisdiction of the state DEP. Many permits under the Coastal Management Act are issued by <coughs> the 36 separate coastal municipalities here in Connecticut. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's, a, it's an integrated process between the, the local planning and zoning staff and the local planning and zoning commission um, and the DEP because anyone who's proposing any activity within the coastal boundary is required to file what's called a coastal site plan. And coastal site plans are required for just about any activity. Um, a subdivision, a special permit or a special exception, um, a variance, and let's see, and any uh, municipal project uh, referred to a local planning commission has to be considered. There are some exceptions to projects or activities <coughs> that may not need a coastal site plan, really minor activities. Um, but for the most part, if you're if you're gonna if you're in the coastal boundary, you're gonna be subject to higher scrutiny. Your project isn't gonna be just reviewed by the 
commission, but it's going to be sent to DEP for a review and a report on consistency with the coastal management policies. And just going to this graphic again, while uh, the mean high water line is further down the beach, Connecticut regulates under the Structured Dredging and Fill Act uh, to the high tide line. So there's an overlap uh, in jurisdiction between uh, local permitting, which goes to mean high water, and the high tide line. And then continuing along, um, since I've been talking so long, um, I'll start looking at some pictures now. Um, the thing about the high tide line is it's not, um, it's just defined under statute as the intersection of the um, uh, highest reach of the tide with the, the upland. I'm, I'm paraphrasing there. And, um, and contains a number of ways that it can be determined. Um, one of the ways is to look at a rack line. And here's a beach um, down in the Caribbean that a, a colleague sent to me um, where you can see all the different rack lines. Uh, they're numbered, one through six, um, which shows the, you know, sometimes uh, trouble with, with deciding where the, um, the high tide line is. And this is, again, just to keep in mind, this is on a nice, gently sloping beach uh, in the Caribbean, Sandy. In Connecticut, our shoreline looks a little different. And it looks a lot of the times more like this, which is um, an area of tidal wetlands, upland, um, old fill. You can see some boulders there on the left. You see uh, a rack deposit that's marked out there. Um, and an estimation of the mean high water. Um, these numbers all can be determined by, uh, by surveyors using tidal data and whatnot. But um, just, to, just to show you that um, it's not always clear where the, the DEP's jurisdiction begins and ends. And that's important um, if you're trying to stay out of their jurisdiction or you thought you stayed out of their jurisdiction. And I don't know if. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a couple of matters where we're, we're fighting over where the high tide line is exactly. Uh, quickly, with uh, Connecticut tidal wetlands jurisdiction, uh, the, the earlier side said it's it's all tidal wetlands are one foot above uh, local extreme high water, which isn't really defined anywhere, but. Um, I grayed out the area on the left saying, just to indicate that the tidal wetlands jurisdiction in Connecticut um, really can extend inland as far as the wetlands go or the, the, the possibility of growing wetland species exists. Now, um, the one good thing about Connecticut is, well, there's a lot of good things about Connecticut, but um, just in terms of jurisdiction over tidal wetlands versus inland wetlands, there is a very clear um, demarcation, and it is the state who, who regulates tidal wetland activities and not the, um, not the local, um, at least here in Connecticut, inland wetlands are regulated by local inland wetlands commissions. Uh, turning to the other state I work in, just to give you another perspective, um, uh, Connecticut has the two acts I mentioned. And they have one set of regulations for their um, tidal wetlands uh, statute. But they have no regulations for their um, structures and dredging, which uh, yeah, sometimes is a problem and, and sometimes is it. I guess it's nice not having regulations, but sometimes it would be nice to, to know exactly what uh, you're dealing with. Um, Rhode Island, on the other hand, has a very extensive um, coastal uh, management program with numerous documents um, covering uh, many different uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, they're, they're, the program is run by what's called the Coastal Resources Management Council. Uh, there's a site to the, the statute there that, that created it. Their regular 
area extends um, from the territorial sea limit, um, mentioned earlier, three miles offshore, uh, to 200 feet inland from any coastal feature. And as I mentioned, it's a highly regulated coastal management program. Here's a, a little picture. Um, this comes from uh, one of CRMC's uh, uh, documents. Um, it shows that's the coastline of Rhode Island on the left. You start with the eastern border with Connecticut has a three-mile state limit and a three-mile limit around that island in the middle is Block Island, for those not familiar. The uh, Rhode Island's regulatory jurisdiction is a little different and, and um, a little, I, I won't say cutting edge because they've been doing it for so long now, um, but what they did was they they categorized um, all the waters of the state and all the shorelines into six uh, water types based upon uh, resources, uh, uses, potential uses, and and here are the here are the six. You have conservation areas, low intensity use, high intensity boating, multi-purpose, commercial, recreational harbors and industrial waterfronts. And what they've done is they have actually mapped uh, the coast. This is, um, this is the map for the uh, southwestern corner of the state near Watch Hill and Westerly. Um, and you can see the numbers in red indicate the uh, type of water that, that we're dealing with. And depending uh, on the type of water is what is permitted at the you know from the upland or in the water. The next step in Rhode Island after water type is they look at coastal features, and um, these include coastal beaches, dunes, barrier islands, coastal wetlands, cliffs, bluffs, rocky shores, man-made shoreline. And again, the, um, the feature uh, the, is regulated not just itself, but 20 feet in from its furthest inland border, which gives the CRMC you know, a, a very wide purview over activities. Uh, and they can and do uh, establish setbacks from activities um, near waters and coastal features. Actually. I'm going to continue with <laughs> items that trigger uh, Rhode Island regulatory jurisdiction. Um, they've also included cultural features, freshwater wetlands, and activities which occur in watersheds, poorly flushed estuaries, with the idea that they want to protect these and, and enhance uh, those estuaries. They don't want anything to make them any worse. And then there's a whole list of statewide activities that they get to say get a say in uh, because of the possibility of those activities impacting uh, the coast and tidal waters. Rhode Island being such a small state with an extensive shoreline, um, everything is really, you're never very far from the ocean. And it is called the ocean state. So for each of those um, Coastal features I spoke about, there's a series of regulations about what you can and can't do. Then you overlay that with the water types, which tells you what you can and can't do. Then you also have to consider uh, a number of special area management plans that the, um, the state has implemented. And, and this is the list of, of eight plans. Um, and so if your project is going to be in any of these areas, you have to uh, review the plan, which again are, are fairly lengthy and specific about what can uh, what can happen, or what they want to see, what the policies are. All, all the plans and the regulations um, have provisions. They're, they really are like zoning regulations. They have provisions for special exceptions. They have provisions for variances, uh, and then provisions for appeals. Um, if um, uh, you know, if the applicant isn't successful or if a neighbor wants to appeal an approval. It's, it's really a, um, um, 
organizing process. Difficult, but well organized. Here's a map of the special area management plans. And then just as an example, just so you see what you're you're dealing with, um, this is again along the south shore of Rhode Island. Um, this points out all the regulated areas, whether it's a coastal feature. Um, it doesn't have the water types, um, but it has the, the boundary between the CRMC wetland jurisdiction uh, versus inland wetlands as you get north of that. But then you also have to consider they have a salt pond, special area management plan. You have freshwater inlands. You have uh, rocky shores, uh, a developed barrier, um, a moderately developed barrier. All these things you need to consider um, when, when you come to permitting in Rhode Island. Okay. When I started, um, we were talking about, I mentioned that there's the sort of coastal permitting resource protection, and then there's also the uh, FEMA jurisdiction, which uh, are implemented through um, FEMA's published floodplain management regulations. They're in the Code of Fed Federal Regulations. And they require uh, each municipality, if you're in the flood zone, to, um, to pass and maintain zoning regulations to remain part of the flood insurance program, which is very important. Um, some particular, and these are, these regulations provide uh, construction, uh, rules for construction um, within the, the flood zones um, and depending on the activity. Um, and just as an example, I, I put here in, in high hazard areas, the V zones, uh, all new construction uh, must be located waterward of the reach of the mean high tide line. And um, I'm trying to keep a theme so you get a picture of these, these lines on the shore and depending on what you're doing, you got to consider where the line is. So I, I want to just put in here how FEMA, they're, they're talking about the mean high tide line. Um, now municipalities can implement and some do more stringent requirements than those that are contained or, or noted as required in the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, for example, there's one uh, municipality uh, here in Connecticut that implemented a 100-foot uh, setback from coastal features, which, depending on the property, can really um, uh, you know, inhibit the ability to, to do anything on the property. There are variance procedures in floodplain management regulations, uh, but you know, the concept being uh, you, you don't want to encourage people to build where they're likely to be flooded and they get penalized through the flood insurance program uh, by higher um, premiums if they are in more flood prone, prone areas. So under FEMA, same thing, no new construction between below mean high water. The other big issue, and um, with any construction along the shore is it, the, the new construction, the, the regulators can really kind of get their arms around uh, those projects. You, you know what the resources are, you know where the flood zones are, uh, and you, you can apply them and you know what the rules are. Um, the issue in a lot of cases for towns that are already developed and you already have houses along the shore, uh, are going to be substantial improvements. What I have here is a, is a um, change to zoning regulations, the floodplain management regulations in Westport, Connecticut. Uh, basically, the concept is that you don't want to encourage people to continue to improve houses, you know, be they beach cottages, uh, 
what have you, uh, that are in a flood um, zone, um, uh, in, and therefore increasing the value of the house uh, without taking steps to make the, the house uh, flood proof. So the basic rule is that if you're going to do a renovation that um, results in uh, or exceeds 50% of the market value of the structure, uh, you need to bring the entire house or structure up to um, code for FEMA. And a lot of that times that requires basically um, raising the structure so that the, the bottom horizontal member of the first uh, floor in which people live is going to be um, one foot above the 100-year flood elevation. And the 100-year flood elevation is really the, the key. That, that's, um, that's the line that um, controls a lot of uh, FEMA uh, policies and rules. But that's difficult to do uh, in a lot of circumstances without completely uh, rebuilding the house and creating um, uh, houses on stilts or um, very oddly designed houses. And also, depending on the value that uh, the local tax assessor places on the house versus the property, you can, uh, you can be in a situation where you have a, a property at least in Connecticut, we've seen this. You have a waterfront piece of property. The, the, uh, the land is worth a million dollars, but the house is worth $300,000. Um, and if you're at a threshold, if you want to do some major renovations to that, you're going to surpass $150,000 in construction costs pretty quickly. You know, uh, uh, for those of you who have renovated a house or built a house, you know, a, a, a new kitchen can cost you fifty thousand dollars just for interior repairs, uh, you know, interior renovations. So, um, um, it 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 can really um, make a big difference um, what you're trying to do, and also the the reason. Getting back, to why I have this particular slide and the changes. Um, is in Connecticut at least, sometimes whether the substantial improvement uh, rules applied or not depended on what town you were in or how they would apply. For example, here in Westport, um, they went from a five-year look-back provision to a lifetime look-back provision. You can see that uh, in the first uh, three lines there. Um, and the, the concept there was, if you're only looking back five years, every fifth year you could do a major renovation and uh, maintain a house that really isn't safe for when the next hurricane strikes. So towns are starting to get a little more strict um, with, uh, with the substantial improvement uh, policies. And here... Um, the definition of, of substantial improvement, you can see, is um, is pretty uh, broad. Okay. Thanks for giving me a minute to catch my breath. Let's just. Um, as we charge here to the end. One of the big issues in Connecticut, and I think in, in other states and, and in Rhode Island, uh, is get, are um, violations along the shore. Um, uh, who's going to be responsible if, if there's an existing violation? Uh, the, the history of this issue, in Connecticut at least, being um, People would build things, a lot of time residential docks without permits. The property would get transferred sometimes 
checking. There was no uh, requirement in Connecticut to record permits. I, I think realtors and, and closing attorneys maybe just turned a blind eye to uh, whether a doc had a permit or not. And I, I know of situations where houses were sold with, um, you know, doc was a key feature, especially older docs, bigger docs that go out into deep water, which uh, may not be, um, you might not be able to get a permit for those anymore. Um, but they never checked to see if it had a permit. So in, in Connecticut, um, uh, the current property owner is deemed to be responsible for maintaining uh, a structure. Uh, and it could be, as I said, a dock. A lot of times it could be a seawall or any type of um, uh, flood and erosion control structure, a pile of rocks um, along the shore under most coastal zone management programs, any type of structure like that that controls flooding or erosion uh, is going to be highly regulated. Um, so if you, sh if you buy a house and it has a, a little seawall, even a garden wall, um, yeah, it's likely that it required a permit. And if you keep it, if you don't rip it out, <laughs> not that you did anything affirmative to maintain it, uh, you're still responsible. And, and it's frustrating. and um, for the owners, um, I will say, for the most part, the the, the DEP staff are understanding um, that people maybe should have done a better job checking, uh, but they'll be understanding and in, in resolving violations. But the statutes are clear that if you retain or maintain anything, you're you're going to be responsible for it. It's the easy cases where you, the person still owns the property who did something. Um, To correct this problem, uh, starting just October of last year, uh, the state now requires that if you receive a permit uh, from the DEP for any coastal activity, you have to record it on the land records. So it will be there for the next, uh, you know, during the next title search. Uh, and they also require that if, you're, if you now own a property that has a regulated activity on it, you have to record the most recent permit prior to transferring the property. And it's new. I've talked to a few town clerks who weren't aware of this. Um, same with uh, real estate attorneys. Uh, but I think as people get understand this uh, requirement, it re will really sort of cut down on um, these situations. Because if you're buying a multi-million dollar house and you're going to the closing and your attorney tells you, um, by the way, there's no permit for that doc, you're going to make uh, accommodations to get that resolved with the seller before you uh, put yourself in a situation where um, you're going to be responsible for uh, permitting the dock or, or ripping it out. In Connecticut, I'm sorry, in Rhode Island, uh, their regulations have required that the applicant record, they call them a sense, uh, on the land records um, uh, at the time after they've received them. And, uh, but the regulations also and the, the, the laws also make clear that you know, any person uh, can be ordered to cease and desist any violation. And that notices, and it's the same in Connecticut, notices or orders um, are recorded on the land records. Okay. Um, I mentioned docks that don't have permits um, and all of the regulations. Um, and uh, for Connecticut, Army Corps, and Rhode Island, um, have grandfathering dates, uh, for lack of a better term, and they're they're here. Connecticut, um, there's one date. The 95 date is actually that's new. That just got moved up from January 1, 1980. Uh, June 24th, 1939 is the um, that's when coastal permitting first came into effect in Connecticut. And there's another uh, statute that specifically talks about. Um, uh, structures or activities that, that predate that date. Uh, but all these are, are hard to um, to meet the eligibility requirements. And, um, it's not always just so simple to say uh, that it was there. Uh, there's other requirements to meet. Uh, generally, it needs to have remained the same uh, since the grandfathering date. 
a lot of times these grandfathering dates will apply easily to uh, seawalls and and revetments and, and things of that nature that someone put in you know, decades ago. Um, but it's harder for docks and things like that because not many have remained the same, uh, especially when in Connecticut the, the grandfathering date was 1980. Um, something would change. And, and Connecticut, like a lot of states, has a whole series of aerial photographs. And you could tell uh, as you look through the series that something's changed. And if, if that's the case, then you don't get to maintain it. And just real quick, um, the, for the um, for Connecticut and grandfathering, Connecticut has um, a simplified permission um, permitting process called the Certificate of Permission um, that allows you, as I was saying, to to get to go through the simplified process to be considered grandfathered. But in general, it has to be continuously maintained and serviceable. That's the term. And as I said, from either the, if it was a pre-39 structure or a pre-95 structure. But the question is always going to be, um, was it continuously maintained and serviceable? And you have situations like this, uh, timber um, bulkhead. You can see in the background there some, some logs are, have fallen in. Is it going to be allowed to, make, to, to remain or be rebuilt? You know, that's, a, that's an unanswered question. Um, but it's some. It's the questions that have to be have to be asked because, uh, as I said, the coastal zone management programs generally um, um, frown upon structural uh, controls for erosion and sedimentation along the shoreline. So I'm going to go now, if you have, um, just to sort of talk about some of these issues and and pictures. Um, I know we have about. 13 more minutes of you hearing me go on and on. Um, so I'd, as I said, I'd talk a little bit about some of these concepts in practice um, and examples of things I talked about. The, the old does not mean OK. This is the situation where you, you buy a property, uh, and this is one of those properties where you have a quite a long dock, but it doesn't have all the permits it, it needs. Um, the new owners, even decades later, there's no sort of statute of limitations um, provisions um, could require that the dock come out, especially if it has impacts on coastal resources and really if it has impacts on navigation. Uh, going back to the concept of public trust, the, the primary concern um, that the state's going to have is that structures do not impact navigation. And just a sense of the change in how uh, the agencies have looked to, um, to to impacts and what's acceptable for um, uh, for structures along the shoreline. These this is a little stretch of shoreline um, along the Connecticut River. Uh, you can see the most southerly property has a pretty extensive dock. I mean, you can't miss that. Um, but then it has uh, armoring and flood and erosion control along the shoreline. The next one up, the dock is um, older, and, and actually is older. Uh, <laughs> but that owner would never get, um, it's highly unlikely, I should say, to get a, um, a permit for a dock as large as the one on the bottom, just because the the concepts of impacts have has changed, um, and then you can see the dock on the top uh, is more typical the type of dock that's that's uh, permitted now. That one is a little unique because you see a very long walkway through um, a high marsh, uh, you know, upper tidal wetland. Um, my experience would be that that depending on how wet the soils are there, uh, the DEP. Uh, probably wouldn't like that type of uh, walkway anymore because it, it cuts up the wetland. Um, and and th with the concept being you want to have as minimal a structure as possible. Now I'll say as, a, as an aside, since I represent property owners and, and I have a <coughs> somewhat <coughs> excuse me, difference of opinion, 
with the regulators about what reasonable access should be uh, from uh, from a you know a waterfront property when it comes to boating access. Um, uh, Connecticut common law refers to access to deep water, um, and Connecticut DEP's policies talk more about reasonable access, which means not all times and tides. Um, I just had a meeting with some regulators yesterday. They they know we have a, a philosophical difference, um, but sometimes for the property owners uh, and for the DEP, it's 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 not worth making a federal case out of maybe ten more feet of dock, uh, shorter or longer. Uh, so it's one of those issues that's constantly simmering, but uh, no one's yet decided to uh, to make a federal case out of it. Seawalls, um, and I'll talk in a little bit about um, climate change and sea level rise, but seawalls are always going to be a point of contention. As I said, um, this is a flood, shoreline flood and erosion control structure. And under Connecticut's Coastal Zone Management Act and under most um, coastal zone management policies, they are frowned upon because they change um, the national uh, natural erosion process and sediment transport. Um, so uh, it, it's it, there's generally a battle if a property owner wants to try to conserve uh, acreage if they're seeing a significant erosion of their coastal property, uh, whether um, whether uh, they'll be allowed to uh, to um, build something. This is actually a site that's um, uh, currently in litigation. Uh, this also represents, this site represents the um, conflict over state and local permitting in Connecticut. There's part of the lawsuit um, involves the location of the high tide line, which is the state's jurisdictional boundary. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a difference of opinion whether this seawall is in the state DEP jurisdiction or solely within the local jurisdiction. Um, and it's, it's uh, without, I don't have to get into the, the issues in the case, but um, you can appreciate that if you just don't need one more permit, then uh, it makes it that much more simple for the, um, for the property owner. And you can see to the left of the picture uh, a, a flood and erosion control structure that you know was allowed. Um, it, it sometimes just comes down to engineering and placement. Uh, <laughs> this is an interesting site. Um, you can see all those halfway completed walls along the shore. Um, those are all, I think I alluded to this earlier, those, those would all still be flood and erosion control structures. Uh, anything that holds back uh, topsoil or fill uh, or would, could potentially impact um, uh, flood waters uh, will be considered a flood and erosion control structure. Um, a lot of times people uh, will want to put in garden walls. You know, these aren't very high sometimes, two or three feet. Uh, something that on a property that wasn't on the coast uh, would be of no concern whatsoever, but can result in uh, violations and removal orders uh, if you're along the shore. Two important resources. Um, we already talked a lot about tidal wetlands, and as you look down this, this is a bulkhead in a tidal creek. You see on the left-hand side intertidal flats. Uh, which are a uh, unique and important uh, resource. They provide um, habitat for small worms, mostly, but shellfish, uh, juvenile shellfish, and um, uh, they are a protected resource. And on the other side, you see uh, a small emergent tidal wetland that got on the wrong side of this bulkhead, uh, at least from our client's perspective. Uh, <laughs> um, through cracks in the um, in the timber bulkhead, both um, while we're not talking a lot of area, 
um, once you have the resource, then you have to deal with the uh, with protecting it or or developing around it. Uh, intertidal flats are are highly um, regulated by the the federal National Marine Fisheries Service and the new what they require a lot I won't say a lot what they're going to require is that um, they have required and will require in the new Connecticut general permit is that any floats that are connected to um, uh, docks have to be uh, designed so that they're elevated with float stops or chains to be 18 inches off uh, this type of mud flat. Uh, that's been sort of a requirement uh, going back five, ten years now, uh, but they're, they're making it official by putting in the new um, general permit that the, the Army Corps intends to issue for Connecticut in May. And you can see, I mean, if you look in the background on the creek side, you can see floats sitting in the mud. You can see a boat sitting in the mud. This is not an unusual occurrence in Connecticut, um, and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, and they're trying to, to, to get away from that. And as long as you know you need to do it, it's, it's no big deal. Uh, other ways around this are boat cradles. Uh, or other uh, design features to keep uh, structures and vessels off the ground. Here, uh, I titled this one, Avoid Wetland Impacts and Protect Benthic Habitat, because this goes to what I was just saying. Um, here's a situation where you have a pier over a, uh, a tidal wetland to a, ra a ramp or gangway um, and a float. You can't tell so much, but that float is, is up on uh, stops. It's not going to touch the bottom. You can see, you know, we're getting towards the low tide here. Uh, that's an entire intertidal area. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the property owner in this circumstances has to appreciate that they, they don't, you know, regardless of any policies about what DEP likes to see for docks, how long they are, or whatnot. Um, when you buy a piece of property like this, you just have to appreciate you're you're not getting access to all the tides. Um, and the DEP, given the littoral rights of each property owner, will uh, accommodate them with some type of dock, uh, but it has to avoid wetland impacts and protect the benthic habitat. In Connecticut, generally, and in New England, with um, the Army Corps and EPAs, what you want to do with wetlands is have a, a, um, a fixed structure if it's going over a wetland to be um, designed so you have a, a foot of clearance over the top of the vegetation uh, during the, at the height of the growing season. The last, the last, this, is, yeah, this is one of my last um, slides. I'll, try to push on through here. Shellfish beds, whenever you're dealing in an area uh, that has shellfish beds, uh, they are protected. Um, in Connecticut, there's statutes about getting, uh, if you want to put a mooring, you have to get permission from the shellfish bed owner. Common law gives um, uh, superior rights to the property owner who's trying to put in a dock. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we have a Bureau of Aquaculture every uh, while they're not a permitting agency for structures or dredging or moorings or anything like that, uh, you do have to get through them. Uh, and their uh, review of the of the application can impact whether you might have to face a, uh, a public hearing or not, which uh, complicates things greatly. And in Connecticut, at least, all beds are protected equally, even I don't know how familiar you all are with um, beds are classified uh, as to their use. Um, you know, some beds you can just pick up a an oyster, shuck it, and eat it. Uh, but if it's if there's pollutants, um, beds can be closed. They can be only used for certain purposes. But uh, that um, designation or classification uh, doesn't change the fact that it's a shellfish bed and has a potential. Um, now you can argue that 
a closed bed due to pollution. You don't have to go to any great lengths to protect it, um, uh, but you still have a shellfish bin. And here's something that you'll never see built again. This is the old Norwalk Yacht Club, and just so you get a sense of the, the permitting <laughs> regime that you have to go through, um, uh, these owners needed permission from the DEP basically to, uh, I'm being a little flip, but to to to, uh, to remodel their kitchen and to change their bathroom. Half of their house was, was within the DEP's jurisdiction. Somewhere around where this door is is the high tide line. And um, in order to do the renovations they wanted on this house, they had to uh, jack it up above the 100-year base flood elevation, uh, do a lot of structural improvements to the foundation, um, and they were not, in the end, able to enclose any of these porches because uh, it was deemed to, to, to conflict with policies under the Coastal Management Act to limit um, hazards to life and property. Uh, I, I disagreed. Uh, but the clients were able to come up with a new design and and get what they you know get something they wanted. But um, this house was highly regulated. And lastly, um, on climate change, and I'm going a little over. I want to save time for questions. Um, it's coming. It's going to be part of our regulatory consideration. Uh, the Army Corps put out this circular. It applies now just to uh, core civil work activities. But as you see, it'll incorporate, they have to incorporate the direct and indirect physical effects of projected future sea level change on all their projects. So I think, I think that's going to happen soon in Rhode Island. Oops, sorry, I've got another slide. Um, just more of the policy uh, from the Army Corps. And so this will require, it doesn't require applicants now, but it requires the, the the Army Corps itself that you have to have planning and studies and engineering designs to consider alternatives. So um, Connecticut now is doing what is called uh, sentinel monitoring. They're just sort of keeping an eye. Rhode Island actually passed a, uh, in, implemented a new regulation. It's part of, it's part of their coastal management uh, regulations that it's their policy to accommodate a base rate of expected three to five foot rise in sea level by the year uh, 2100. So, and, and that's for the implementation of public and private coastal activities. So they're going to look at that uh, with all their applications. And just last, um, and, and what are we concerned of? I say the agencies, but I guess we should all be. Because uh, here's what happens. Um, you start with sea level 5,000 years ago, and the marsh just above sea level, uh, salt tolerant plants. Today, um, we've got sedimentation and peat uh, formation uh, below the the um, current sea level and supporting the tidal marshes. And now you have houses. Um, if you put in a hard structure um, to protect the house, and the sea level goes up. As the sea level goes up, those salt-tolerant plants, um, they can tolerate salt. They can't live in salt water for the most part. And you start to lose the wetlands. And you have a shoreline that's completely armored. Um, so that's the concern. Um, I have a whole other presentation about uh, the property rights impacts of, of maybe prohibiting someone from putting up a wall. And you know, where, do you, where do you have a taking? Um, but that's for another time and place. Um, but this is something that definitely needs to be considered um, as we go forward. So that's my last slide. Um, and I guess we'll take questions. All set, Cody? Yes. Um, so back to your on the size does not matter slide, if you want to yeah. go back to that. Um, Valerie just had a question. Uh, she was wondering if you are suggesting that the regulations are advocating the filling of the marsh with grass instead of a boardwalk on piles over the marsh. Uh, 
aren't they? The in 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 Connecticut now, there's what they look at is um, scientifically they'll they'll try to determine the break between the what the high marsh and the low marsh based on uh, plant species. And I'm not a biologist, um, but I can I'll, I'll do my best. Um, the policy and and uh, commentary and I'm sure there's some Connecticut people on the phone. Um, Connecticut doesn't have regulations; they just have policies. Uh, the Connecticut DEP, but the policy is that um, they don't want to see walkways through high marsh. Uh, they'll allow walkways over low marsh to allow someone to access, you know, access to the water. Um, so they're not advocating um, uh, walkways through the marsh, excessive um, walkways. Uh, and actually, in a recent the recent case I talked about where I was just at the Planning and Zoning Commission on Tuesday, um, people asked about that and, um, um, you know, it was an issue in the hearing at the DEP and the DEP said, we, you know, we're really, while they might allow it in the future if the sea level rises and you're talking, and the high marsh turns into low marsh, um, for now they're going to make people walk through high marsh for the most part and, you know, get their feet a little wet. Now, the client in that situation really didn't care about that. He, he liked the privacy that walking through the marsh afforded him and his family. Um, so, uh, so no, the, the DEP is not encouraging long uh, structures through marshes. All right, thank you. Um, David asked some local municipalities, uh, he believes the uh, Goulford is an example, have begun to incorporate anticipated sea level rise into local CZM planning and codes. Do you know of any other examples? I don't know if that's a Connecticut, I guess, as a Connecticut specific question. I don't know of any um, other examples of towns that have passed something like that. I know Groton um, is doing a pilot study on the effects of sea level rise and zoning. Um, so that might be something uh, he might want to look into. I can't remember all the details off the top of my head. I apologize. Okay, and then um, Brian, um, as he lives in Hawaii, and there they use a shoreline setback ordinance where setbacks are to be established based on the equation using historical erosion rates. Um, do you guys use any of that in Connecticut or Rhode Island? Rhode Island has that, um, and they have, yes, they use that in Rhode Island. They don't use that in Connecticut. Really, once you're um, in Connecticut, once you're outside, you're either, if you're doing a development project on the upland, you're, you're most likely not in the state DEP jurisdiction. So all the coastal zone management considerations will come through the what, what we call the coastal site plan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that'll be commented on by the DEP, but they're not the regulatory authority. So um, while erosion and you know impacts from flood are something that have to be considered, there's no specific setback requirement. And you know we've seen things you know very close to tidal wetlands because we don't have a setback requirement from tidal wetlands either. Uh, we have a what we call an upland review area for inland wetlands in Connecticut, uh, but there's no setback requirement. Uh, so you can be if you propose something 10 feet from a tidal wetland in Connecticut, you don't have to go to the DEP. Okay. Um, our next question is from Tom. Do floodplain regulations and floodplain or flood insurance programs have an unintended consequence of promoting the maintenance of structures in the floodplain rather than place the risk of occupying a floodplain on the private property owner? Okay. Do they? Would you read like that to read that one more time? Yeah. yeah. So, do floodplain regulations and flood insurance programs have an unintended consequence of promoting the maintenance of structures in the floodplain rather than place the risk of occupying a floodplain on a private property owner? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
a what I think, and I'm not a, an expert on on the flood insurance program, but what I think they encourage sometimes is um, it's just the maintenance of structures that are not flood proofed um, by um, uh, by requiring you know by really as I said earlier, if you want to do the substantial maintenance, um, you know you can really trigger um, a, uh, uh, a major basically renovation to your house. So um, uh, Tom, you asked a tough one. Um, coast, I guess. It's tough to say because a lot of times people are just sort of hanging on with their existing structures and they're not doing anything. So to the to the to the extent that there's no more investment in flood prone structures or structures that aren't flood proofed, um, then the floodplain management regulations are doing the right thing. Um, because they have to balance, you know, the the property interest of the um, uh, of the owner uh, with the public uh, interest in uh, minimizing flood damage and and the need to sort of bail people out. I don't know if that's a I don't think that's a great answer, but maybe if Tom has a follow up, well. Okay. Um. JP asks, can you talk about coastal management in the context of regula regulatory takings, decisions, and impl implications for citizens and governments trying to protect the land? Uh, y yes, <laughs> but I don't know how much time we Briefly, have. Yes. Um, there's Briefly, <laughs> yes. Briefly, yes. There's, um, you know, there's, um, there's a few cases, the Lucas case, um, uh, and I looked at them briefly. I actually specifically took them out of this presentation. Um, there's a series of cases um, regarding takings as it relates to um, coastal management. Um, and maybe, I think the, probably the best answer is if, if my email's here, I, I, if, um, if the person with a question wants to get in contact with me, that's probably the easiest thing to do. Because there, there's cases out of Massachusetts where someone wasn't allowed to build. Uh, there was a case, a uh, recent case in New Jersey um, that went back years, but I can't remember all the details. There's the cases out of South Carolina. Uh, there's the recent Stop the Beach Renourishment case from the um, Supreme Court, so it's a it's a very uh, interesting and complex area of uh, takings law. So I would just encourage that person to give me a call or or send me an email. Okay, um, Jean asks, does a public trust doctrine apply similar similarly in New York as it does in Connecticut? Um, in New York State, the NYSDEC has mapped tidal and freshwater wetlands boundaries, would Connecticut benefit from a more well-defined boundary? I think they would. I think Connecticut would benefit from a more well-defined boundary. Um, my understanding of the public trust doctrine is that it's pretty universal um, state to state, that, all they, that it applies to all the different states. What What's happened is, um, with the passage of Coastal Management Act and other environmental regulations, sometimes the legislation sort of occupies the field uh, that that was once occupied by the public trust doctrine. The, when you have specific statutes and regulations, you know those are going to be the first things you look at, and the public trust doctrine might just sort of fill in the gaps where. Um, where specific legislation is, is missing. In Connecticut, they, the, they use it to, because, I'll be a little cynical, 
reasons for their disposable permitting program uh, for structures. So a lot of times they just rely on their, their obligations, they being the, the DEP, rely on their, their obligations under the public trust doctrine to, um, you know, to determine impacts. Okay, um, for those of you that still want to ask a question, um, please send those in and we can try to get those in before we close up today. Um, our next question is from Francis. Will gener general efforts to reduce numbers of federal regulations streamline pr processes or will we always have a local versus federal versus state versus commissions, et cetera? In, when it comes to permitting coastal projects, I, my experience is the, I have the least amount of problems, and take that word for what it, whatever you will, uh, it's easiest with the federal authorities. Um, you know, the New England District of the Army Corps has, has created these programmatic general permits, and it's very straightforward what, you know, there's two different categories, um, and if you go in category one, you don't need anything. If you're in Category 2, you need agency review. And then after the review, they just send you a letter. You don't even have to send in um, a, a particular uh, application form or anything like that. They just use the state or the local application to determine impacts. Uh, and it's all very clear, you know, if you're doing a wetlands project, if you stay under uh, 5,000 square feet of disturbance in a, um, and I apologize, I think I got that right. Uh, <laughs> on an inland wetlands project, you don't have to deal with um, the, the Army Corps. It's a Category 1. So the federal agencies haven't been troublesome. What, what I found is that as you go down, um, the local commissions have become, and again, it depends on the town, have become the most problematic. As, just to be clear on the, the, the matter I just had where I was at the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, we, we got our federal permit. We got our state permit. Um, the entire dock was either um, was in title, either in title wetlands or totally in state or federal jurisdiction, but there's 22 feet of fixed pier from where it started on the upland, crossed wetlands, and then went beyond the mean high water line into state and federal jurisdiction, um, 22 feet of fixed pier that had two permits, gone through, you know, coastal zone consistency, but it, we still had to go to the local um, planning and zoning commission and still had a faced opposition. And I've been in someone, uh, I think David's question mentioned, Guilford, Connecticut. I was in Guilford, Connecticut and watched their planning and zoning commission uh, deny um, an application for you know 10, 20 feet of dock that already had its permits um, because of what I thought. It wasn't my client. I was there <laughs> on another matter. I wanted to say something, but um, but for reasons that had nothing to do with their jurisdiction. And it, it knowing that you know for a simple residential dock it can take two or three years. Um, you know, to, to get to the end and have all your permits and have a local commission deny you for 10 feet of a dock uh, on bases that have already been reviewed by federal and state authorities, it, it was, it's very frustrating. So um, it's not the federal government that's, that's the issue here. Uh, as you get into bigger projects, obviously they have more concerns, but um, it's, 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 some, it's the state and local. Okay, well, I just want to thank you, John. Um, we have run out of time, and so okay. um, this will conclude our presentation for today. Um, for those of you still in attendance, I just want to go through a few basic reminders on how to log your CM credits. Um, first of all, you'll just need to go to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by date, and then select today's date, February, February. Friday, February 18th, and then it will be listed underneath coastal development and regulatory realities. Um, another um, thing is just that we have been recording today's session, so you'll be able to find a PDF and a video recording of today's webinar at www.utah-apa.org slash 
what past webcast.htm and then this should be up by Monday. And again, I just want to thank you all for attending and I want to say a thank you to you as well, John, um, for giving today's presentation. Thanks for all your help, Cody. And thank you all.